Hello everybody. Do you have an idea for a true crime podcast? I publish true crime podcasts at my YouTube channel, Leader One Studios. I currently have 23,000 subscribers who are always looking for new true crime podcasts to listen to. This is an opportunity to build an audience quickly. If you're interested in joining the Leader One Podcast Network, send an email to morgansvariety at gmail.com and we can discuss the details. Hello everybody. Gratitude to everybody for listening and additional heaps of gratitude to everybody who donates to the Patreon account. You keep the show going with your donations. As I keep the expenses paid, the more content I can create. You can donate at www.patreon.com slash leader one. Or if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can send one through PayPal at morganrector331 at hotmail.com. Remember, there is no minimum donation, no maximum donation. If $1 a month is all you feel like you can manage, especially in these difficult times, it's still appreciated. Thank you for everything and enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. Moll French was born in October 1982 in Leicestershire, England. Her family was indigent, living in overcrowded, semi-detached social housing, or what is known in England as a council house. There were eight inhabitants in her home, six children and the parents. Childhood was not a happy time for Moll. She was often mocked because of the hand-me-down clothing she wore. She also had limited control over her bladder and had accidents in public, including at school, which invited even more ridicule. Upon one such incident, her teacher swooped down like an avian predator. She shouted, You dirty Arab! The rest of the children in the classroom laughed at Maul. The reason it happened was she asked her teacher if she could use the lavatory, but permission was not granted because she hadn't finished her milk. This was the 80s, after all. It was the decade in which Big Dairy convinced parents through their propaganda that denying children an everlasting supply of milk was tantamount to child abuse. The teacher made Maul sit on a plastic chair in a corner while a student was dispatched to summon the janitor. She was given clean, donated clothing to wear for the rest of the school day. Though the floor was cleaned and Maul's clothing was replaced, her reputation was forever tarnished. Nobody wanted to be friends with the girl who soiled herself. One day a teacher noted to Maul's mother that she needed eyeglasses. One day after receiving them, Maul was summoned to her family's living room. She anticipated that she was going to be harangued about an incident that occurred at school. When she entered the living room, she found that her father was not alone. His friend Derek had come to visit. Maul didn't like Derek. There was something dodgy and creepy about him. He made her skin crawl. Her father said to her, Don't look so worried. You're not in trouble. We just wanted to see what your new glasses look like. Maul smiled somewhat, not used to being the object of such attention. She was usually overlooked due to occupying one of the lower echelons of the family hierarchy. Derek said, Oh, they look very special, don't they, Jim? Jim said, Are you going to say thank you to Derek, or just stand there? Small said, Thank you, Derek. Maul was never in the mood to exchange pleasantries with a lowlife like Derek, but she knew that if she didn't thank him, there would be hell to pay. 
given the nature of her parents' methods of discipline. Jim said the last thing she wanted to hear that day. Go and give him a hug then. Maul was aghast. Not only was she disinclined to hug anybody, but the thought of hugging Derek made her outright queasy. It seemed unsanitary just to breathe the same air as Derek. The thought of doing this was unbearable. She said, but I don't want to. Her eyes filled with tears. This did nothing to elicit sympathy in Jim. He said, don't be such a little cow and give Derek a hug before he gets offended. Because if he does, you'll be in trouble. Maul walked over to Derek tentatively. Derek was the stuff of hazmat suits and petri dishes. Maul was exposed to bacteria and her risk of infection seemed alarmingly high. She delayed the approach as much as possible, walking in slow motion baby steps. She avoided eye contact which was more important than ever now that she could see him more clearly with her glasses. He lifted her up and put her on his knee. He squeezed her tightly against him. He laughed. She wasn't nearly as amused, especially not with the tobacco stench of his breath blasting her face. It was enough to cough up sputum of one's own, with or without lung cancer. She disassociated, thinking of her favorite toy, which was a mermaid. She fantasized about being a real mermaid, living under the sea, and the adventures that would transpire in that milieu. Jim's words did nothing to alleviate her anxiety or soothe her churning stomach. You look very sexy in your new glasses. Jim cracked this joke for Derek's benefit. Having had her fill of Derek as soon as she entered the room, Maul jumped down from his lap. It was an awkward moment, as she didn't know where to look or turn as their attentions were focused on her, and it made her uncomfortable. Derek said to Maul, You could be our sexitary. Would you like that? At the age of six, Maul knew what a secretary was. She had never heard tell of a sexitary. Instinctively, there was something about the word sexitary that implied that there was something insidious behind its usage. The last thing she would have wanted was a translation into child so she could better understand its meaning. Maul stared at the floor for a few more minutes before Jim dismissed her. As she closed the door, both men laughed uproariously. Maul went up to her bedroom, where she looked out at a world where she felt very much unwanted. She had no friends. She wasn't close to her siblings. Her mother was always too busy or tired to spend quality time with her. After a while, she gave up on her friendship with her mother. It was less painful to write her off than it was to be consistently rejected by her. Maul loved her glasses at first, after the incident with her father and Derek, she was determined she would never wear them again. She did not want anybody leering at her as they did. So neglected of love and attention was she that Maul often went to sleep without dinner because nobody bothered to wake her from her slumber. Her father told her mother about Maul's self-prompted narcolepsy. He told her it was because she thought she was a cut above every other occupant of the house. From that point onwards, everybody, especially Maul's siblings, made a scapegoat out of Maul. Casting one member of the family in the role of adversary is a common fixture of dysfunctional families. Maul wouldn't even wear her glasses to school, and she struggled to keep up. Derek and Jim tainted the experience of vision correction for her. One day while Maul was in the kitchen cleaning up, Jim came in and put the kettle on. There was a pile of clean laundry on the table, and he sifted through it. Claiming it was accidental, he dropped a pair of black satin briefs on the floor. They brushed against Maul's leg as they fell. There was a gold zipper running over the crotch. He laughed and said, Oops, sorry, I wasn't looking for those. He picked them up and said, These are your mom's favorites. 
She loves it when I wear them, but they look a little bit funny with the zip. Do you know what it's for? Maul shook her head and turned away, diverting her gaze to a pan she was scrubbing. She was hoping he would shut up about the damn underwear. He did, but then he said, I'm going in the bath in a minute, in about 15 minutes. Will you make a new pot of tea? Just bring it up and don't worry about knocking. He departed, satin briefs in hand. Don't worry about knocking. That sounded ominous, even to a child as young as she. Maul knew somehow that something untoward was afoot. She also knew she would be harshly punished if she didn't deliver the bathside tea as requested. He might go as far as whipping her with his belt. She also had to be careful about how she prepared the tea. One time when she added too much sugar, Jim hit her so hard on her leg she couldn't sit at school. When Maul reached the bathroom, she badly wanted to turn back. She knew she would see him naked in the tub, and it was a visage she could have done without, to put it mildly. She bit the bullet and entered the bathroom. The first thing she noticed was the absence of bubble bath scent. It meant his entire body was on display. The transparency of water failing in its utility as a shroud of modesty. The tub had only been filled to about a quarter of its depth, leaving him fully exposed. Maul's eyes darted about the room, desperate to find anything else on which to settle. Jim seemed amused by this. Acting as if this scenario was entirely normal, he said, Can you bring it over here, please, before it gets cold? Jim took a sip and spat it out. He said, It's bloody cold. She said, But I thought you liked cold tea. I do, but not when I'm in the bath. It's because you're too damn lazy to make a new pot of tea, isn't it? You don't give a damn about anybody but yourself in this house. Maul looked down at the floor. It was always hard to look at him, no matter what the situation. Finally, he said, Just get out. I'm disappointed with you yet again. I'll give you one important job, and you can't even get that right. You're not part of this family. He punctuated this last point by picking up a wet towel and throwing it at her face. Maul fled the room. An hour later, Maul was downstairs when Jim came down wearing only a towel around his waist. Maul was desperate to escape. She never wanted to converse with him, but especially not while he was trying to expose himself. He sat on his chair with his legs spread wide to make Maul uncomfortable. They had been watching a British show comparable to America's Funniest Home Videos called You've Been Framed. At one point, Jim stood and the towel fell to the floor. He laughed and ran around behind the bar he installed. He said it was a shame there was no video camera around to capture the event. Everybody in the room thought it was hysterical. Everyone except Maul, that is. It turned her stomach. Another way in which Jim made Maul uncomfortable was his tendency to watch her sleep. It frightened her, and she would pretend to be asleep. One night Jim summoned Maul to watch television with him. Maul had been fascinated by dinosaurs, and he buttoned hold her into a conversation about that topic as he watched a stripper perform on television. She hated it when he watched such programs while she was around. She always got the feeling that he was watching for her reaction. Maul felt so uncomfortable she made excuses to leave. She told him she needed to take their dog outside so he could do his business. When she came back in, Jim was short with her telling her to go to bed if she didn't want to talk to him. It was two o'clock in the morning, so it wasn't in her best interests to do so. She went back to bed, feeling more isolated than ever. Maul's alienation from her family only got worse. Her older sister became a model. Her parents bought her new clothes, and her father took promotional photos of her in the back garden. They were noted by how risque they were. 
Maul resented her for being smug and for pointing out that Maul wasn't pretty enough to be a model. Her freckles factored into this evaluation. It was also due to being a tomboy and to her nervous habit of picking at her skin, leaving her with scabs. She picked at herself when her mother wasn't home. Her face and arms were covered with them, and her parents made sure to tell her they made her look ugly. This didn't trouble Maul. She wanted to be a scientist. One day, Maul's mother brought Maul and her sister to one of her sister's modeling gigs. When her mother called Jim to let him know they'd made it safe and sound, there was a brief argument. She took it out on Maul as the only one of her children who was conveniently located at the time. You know, if it wasn't for you lot, we wouldn't have arguments like this. If it wasn't for you kids, I'd leave your father and be happy. Maul was crushed after hearing this. It wasn't her charge in life to take responsibility for an adult's happiness, and it was something for which she was unprepared. She digested this condemnation quietly. Maul was looking forward to this outing, as they were scheduled to eat out at a restaurant. Instead, she was treated to the bitter flavor of her mother's unwillingness to be accountable for her poor decision-making. Her mother fingered the wound. You know how you came into this world, don't you? Maul shook her head. She said, no. Her mother said, it's a funny story. Want to hear it? Yes. Maul was happy to hear this since it meant being the focus of her mother's attention, and that was a rarity in Maul's life. Well, it all started when my dad, your granddad, died. You never got the chance to meet him because he died before you were born. Your nana was in a right state for a long time afterwards, so we had her move in with us. It was fine to begin with, and we'd not long had your brother. Your nana had her own ideas about the way we should be bringing Alex up, and we didn't agree with her interfering. Anyway, after we fell out, she locked herself in the bedroom and refused to come out. We left trays of food outside the door, but she refused to eat, like she was on some kind of hunger strike. We were getting worried about her until your father caught her shimmying down the drain pipe one evening. It turned out that she'd been sneaking off to the bingo every evening for her dinner. We were so cross when we found out, and we'd had enough of her interfering, so decided she had to go. That's why we had you, because then there would no longer be space for her, and she'd have to move out. Funny, though, I get on better with her since she moved out. She smiled at Maul, and Maul forced a smile back at her but inwardly, she was on the verge of tears. After all, she had just found out that she was conceived as a utility for her family, first as a bargaining chip in a domestic dispute, and later as a scapegoat and domestic servant. Maul recalled that her nana never liked her and treated her poorly compared to the other children. She never brought her presents for Christmas, claiming to have forgotten to do so. If she babysat, she ignored Maul while she watched Coronation Street. If Maul made any noise while the show was on, her grandmother would threaten to destroy her toys and tell her mother she was responsible. Maul stayed out of her way, and she hated the sight of her face anyway, so she was always better off playing behind the couch. One day, Maul was abducted by a group of teenage males, they drove her away in their car. She wasn't raped when they finally realized the seriousness of the crime they were committed, so they let her off. When Maul got home and entered the house, her father was there. She told him about what happened to her in hopes that she might receive some consolation. He digested the information thoughtfully for a moment. Then he said, Did they penetrate you with their fingers? This was about the last thing Maul wanted to hear. She was shocked and disgusted. She said, No, they didn't do anything to me besides one of them putting their hand over my mouth. I've already told you. As usual, it was impossible for her to make eye contact with him. He leaned forward and spoke at a lower volume. 
then don't bother me with your silly fucking problems. You brought it on yourself, dressing like a little tart. Why, I often think, you know, if you weren't my daughter. He had used that phrase before, the, if you weren't my daughter, and it was always a cringe fest. She always had this vague and discomforting feeling that he was going to kiss her, and not in the fashion that is appropriate for a father and daughter. It always made her feel awkward and uneasy. Once, when they went on a shopping excursion, he kept saying people might think she was his girlfriend, even though she was only nine years old at the time. She didn't dress like a tart. She wore jeans, t-shirts, and other clothing that is typical for little girls at play further driving home the point that he felt she deserved no sympathy for her close brush with sexual assault, he said, Oh, and don't go burdening your mom with this, either. She's been at work all day. Do you understand? She nodded and took her burden upstairs with her to her room. As usual, she was left to sort out her troubles on her own. It was about this time that one day a police riot van pulled up in front of Maul's house. The police brought her father out from the back and escorted him to the front door. Maul eavesdropped as they explained to her mother that her father was observed hiding in bushes at a university with binoculars. He claimed it was a misunderstanding that he was looking for exotic animals to watch. The police didn't buy it. Maul enrolled in martial arts classes at her parents' behest. They felt it was unhealthy for her to live a hermetic existence at home alone. She enjoyed them and became passionate about the sport. Her instructor, Bernie, took an interest in her, expressing pride in her progress and even getting her to help him demonstrate moves to the class. One November evening, he got the students together for a bonfire outdoors. At one point, he said to Maul, You look ravishing tonight. In fact, I wish I could ravish you myself. She didn't understand what this meant at such a young age, but she took it as a compliment. The following year, she received a Valentine's card in the mail. The sender did not indicate their identity. The handwriting suggested it could either have been Bernie or her father. The message, Dear Valentine, when I think of you, my heart starts to throb, not to mention other parts. Her parents thought it was funny. It never occurred to them that it was inappropriate. Bernie stopped paying attention to Maul after a while because she brought a couple of male friends to the club for lessons. When he asked Maul to help him demonstrate moves to the class, he would apologize whenever his hands wound up in inappropriate places. After the class left, he would ask her to help him put away equipment in a small room upstairs. While they were alone together, he would play with her hair or massage her back. It was about this time that Maul revealed to Bernie that she owned a keyboard and had been learning to play, becoming quite proficient. He was a musician himself and offered to give her lessons for free. The first two lessons took place at Maul's house, and were very formal, with all the emphasis placed on music. The third time they got together for this purpose, he began to ask her personal questions. He was curious to understand her connection to her friend John, the boy she brought into the class. Bernie said, John's a nice boy, isn't he? I suppose you spend a lot of time together at school, don't you? He watched the reaction on her face with a microscopic focus. Maul said, yeah, he's okay. It's not as though he's my boyfriend or anything, though. We just hang out. Bernie said, I just don't want him to hold you back. That's all, pedal. Another evening when Bernie came over for music lessons, he brought a brown satchel with him. Once he was alone with Maul, he reached into the satchel and produced a half dozen red roses. Maul was shocked. She didn't understand why he would want to do this. To alleviate her confusion, he said, Because you're doing so well with your keyboard lessons, I brought these for you. 
You might want to tell your parents that you got them from somebody at school. It's just that if they see I've bought you flowers, they'll think I'm trying to take their place as a parent, which I'm not, of course. When she was sure she was out of the sight of her parents, Maul ran upstairs and put the roses in her school bag. Bernie continued to buy her gifts. He gave them to her after martial arts classes and always reminded her to keep it a secret. He advised her to tell people she won them at sparring competitions, since many of the gifts were articles of martial arts training devices. After giving her the gifts, he would ask her for a hug. He would say it was okay to hug him because he wasn't a pervert like her father. Whenever he had competitions at the training club, Maul tended to win and he would award her with trips like to seminars or an outside tournament. She was the only student who accompanied him to these events. Her parents never objected. During one of these trips, a tournament in London, he bought her a small presence all day long. At one point, he brought her to an area otherwise populated only with vending machines. He said, I need to tell you something, and I don't want you to get upset. Maul was worried that she had done something wrong. Her stomach began to churn. Bernie said, it's just that after today, well, I don't think I'm going to be able to teach you anymore. The piano lessons are going to have to stop too. He keenly anticipated her reaction. Maul said, But why? What have I done? Maul's heart was broken by this. Bernie said, It's nothing you've done, really. Not that you know about, anyway. She said, What have I done? What, whatever I've done, I'm sorry. Please don't stop me training. It's the only thing I have. Bernie said, I've fallen for you, Petal. That's what this is about. All she could manage to say in response was, Oh. Now she knew what all the gifts and undivided attention had been for. She felt flattered, though in an awkward sort of way. Still, she didn't want to give up the martial arts training. It was something that provided her life with meaning and fulfillment. She anxiously awaited a solution of her own to this problem. Bernie introduced one of his own. He said, Although there is another option, it could be our little secret. Nobody would need to know a thing. I suppose it depends on how you feel about that. Maul shrugged. She wasn't sure how to handle this. She had had a boyfriend once, but it was nothing serious, not while still a child. She didn't know the full implications of what Bernie was proposing. She felt she could withdraw if she needed to anyway. He held her hand. He smiled. He said, If you stick around long enough, I might even make you an instructor, and you can run your own classes. Would you like that? She said, Yes, I would. That's what I've always wanted to do. Suddenly, the awkwardness of their previous line of dialogue disappeared from her memory bank. He said, Better keep it quiet then. Just act normally around your parents, and don't tell a soul that I plan to make you an instructor. It would upset a lot of people at the club, because they've been training a lot longer than you, and they'll never be good enough. You don't want to make people jealous, do you, Petal? No. It's our little secret. As Bernie drove himself and Maul home, he made a detour. He pulled into a small country lane on the outskirts of town. He told her to get into the back seat. He joined her there. Bernie straddled Maul. He caressed her hair and her face. She froze. He gyrated up against her, rubbing his body against hers. Maul was stiff as a board. It occurred to her that this sort of activity was typical of an adult relationship. Once he was finished with this activity, he returned to the driver's seat and resumed their commute. When he dropped her off, he said, Remember, Petal, it's our secret. I'll see you at training on Tuesday. 
She smiled at him and got out of the car. She felt confused. She decided that it was worth it to let him touch her if it meant she could continue with her martial arts and music lessons. She looked forward to getting her own club going one day. She felt that she was paying her dues in order to make that happen. She would keep her eye on the prize. One day when James forbade Maul from taking martial arts classes for two weeks due to finding out she was smoking, she decided she couldn't bear to miss the classes and disappoint Bernie. On the day of her next class, she skipped school and went to Bernie's house. When he opened the door, he said, Aren't you supposed to be at school? Does anybody know you're here? Nobody knows where I am, except me and you now. You'd better come in before somebody sees you on the doorstep, because then we'll both be in trouble. Bernie gave her what he called an Irish coffee. He said it would calm her nerves. He said, So, why have you bunked off? You know your parents will go mental when they find out, don't you? They've grounded me because my dad thought I had cigarettes in my school bag. He laughed after he heard the rest of the story. He said, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but your dad's mentally ill. There's a counselor at school that I talk to quite a lot. Bernie's throat was strangled by panic. Counselor, what have you been saying to him? You haven't mentioned me, have you? For God's sake, Maul, if you mention me, then that will be the end of everything. She lied, saying, I haven't mentioned you at all, only my dad and the way things are at home. She only told her counselor about Bernie's mentorship and the positive ways in which he had helped her develop as a human being. This made him relax. He was still anxious to drive home how serious the situation was. It's just that if people find out, then they'll split us up. You'll be put into care, and I won't be able to teach you anymore, which would be a shame because I plan to make you an instructor soon so you can run your own classes. Her spirits lifted, mentioning her dream and qualification to run her own classes always did the trick. He said, if I can't teach you anymore, there would be no point in me sticking around here. I'd probably end up moving away, and that would be the end of that. She said, I don't want that to happen. Bernie said, you just need to be a little careful who you speak to then, Petal. There are a lot of narrow-minded, spiteful people out there who can't bear to see other people happy. People like your parents. People like your counselor at school. The phone rang. It was Maul's father. Bernie said, No, Jim, I've not seen her today. What time did she go missing? Give me ten minutes, Jim, and I'll help you come and look for her, okay? It's not a problem. See you soon. He turned to Maul and said, I don't know what you're going to do, but your dad sounds furious. They're out looking for you. Bernie had been in bed. He got out. He was stark naked. He walked to a wardrobe and dressed himself. It wasn't anything she hadn't witnessed before. By now, there was a sexual component to their relationship, and it was well established. He said, So what are you going to do? You know you need to go home at some point, don't you? I will go home, but I don't know what I'm going to say when they ask me where I've been. I don't know what to suggest, Petal. I'm not condoning lying, but maybe you could tell them you skipped school because of bullying. You'll have to find somewhere to hide out for a bit while I go over to your house. If you tell me where you're going to be, I can try and keep them away from the area, you see? and I'll convince your dad to take it easy on you when you go home. Can I stay here for a bit? They won't find me here, will they? I can't stress how important it is that nobody finds out about us because they just won't understand. She said, I'll go and sit in the park around the corner for a couple hours then, I suppose. Come on, Maul, don't be like that. It'll be over soon. You might have to put up with your dad raving at you for a while, but just remember what a moron he is, and you'll be okay. 
When he took her outside, he escorted her to the end of his driveway to ensure nobody was watching them. He said, Bloody hell, it's freezing out there. It was raining heavily. She said, Can I borrow a coat, please? I can't pedal. Sorry. If you turn up at home wearing my coat, they're going to know I've seen you, and they'll start asking you all kinds of questions. You know what your dad's like. I'm sure you don't want that, do you? No, I suppose not. Maul went to a park and sought refuge from the rain in some playground equipment. She cried as she pondered her wasted youth and the family she'd never had. Bernie was the only person who had shown real love to her, but it was an inappropriate and abusive sort of love. She was harboring a great deal of unresolved anger, and she felt remorseful about hurting people. She wished she had gone to school. After growing up in a dysfunctional family, she now was dysfunctional. The city was struck by thunder and lightning. She wished for a lightning bolt to strike her in that moment so it would bring about an end to all her suffering. After all, her life had mostly been a losing streak. When the wrath of Mother Earth spared her the electrocution, she left the playground and went home to face the music. Her mother and father could shout at her all they wanted, but one of the effects of learning a martial art is that the students lose their fear of others, especially when the proverbial bark is worse than its bite. Indeed, Maul no longer feared her father. He was fond of going on photographic expeditions in nature, but she told him she would no longer be available for what she considered to be a waste of time. In fact, she refused to go anywhere with him at this point. She also lost any respect she may have had for him, and there wasn't much to begin with. Bernie continued to lavish attention on Maul. He would pick her up and drop her off before and after the martial arts classes. She never became accustomed to the backseat interactions. In fact, she dreaded them. They got caught by a police officer once, but he didn't assume that she was underage. Indeed, she had been able to buy cigarettes for her girlfriends because she looked mature beyond her calendar age. Maul was hooked on everything about the martial arts classes. There was a feeling of family that she didn't get at home. She loved the attention Bernie bestowed upon her when it wasn't sexual in nature. He kept her at his side by dangling the carrot of her opportunity to teach her own classes. It had yet to manifest, and in the meantime, he was having his way with her. During a session with her counselor at school, Maul was encouraged to write about the issues that were causing her distress. What she did was write an eight-page, double-sided letter to Bernie. She shared her thoughts about her life in general and specifically about her family. She intended to give him the letter on the Friday of that week after their class. During the interim, it was stored under her bed between the pages of a book. Maul's sister Beth went snooping through Maul's belongings and found the letter. She gave it to Jim. Maul's freedom was curtailed. If Beth wasn't able to babysit her, she was not allowed to leave the house except to go to school. She was impatient to move out. She intended to get in touch with Bernie the moment the opportunity arose. She lied to her family, telling them that she accepted that everything about her relationship with him including the martial arts and music lessons, were a thing of the past, and she was eager to begin anew. Her parents informed her that they reported Bernie to the police. They tried to make her what is referred to in England as a ward of court. Such a person is deemed by law to be unable to look after themselves and has no other qualified authority figure to do so. Age and disability are the usual qualifying factors to having this status conferred upon a person. One day when Maul accompanied Beth and one of her friends to a movie theater, Maul informed Beth that she wasn't interested in seeing the film Armageddon and would see something else. Beth agreed and went to see the film of her choosing. Maul called Bernie from her home's landline and arranged to meet him at a park. 
She deleted his number after calling him. Even if her family found out that she called him, it wouldn't make much of a difference since she was determined to move out before then. When Bernie joined her, he made an announcement. I have found us a place in Peterborough. It has a garden. We even have our own tree. You're going to love it. Less than a week to go now. John said he'll keep you updated with everything. He's going to ask his mom to pick you up on your birthday, and I'll get you from their house. The club just isn't the same without you. Loads of people have left. I've told them that I'd still be coming back on Fridays and the odd Tuesday, but they seem to have given up. Bernie promised that once she was living the life of an adult with her, she would start teaching her own classes. She was looking forward to her new life, which would exclude her family entirely. Bernie concluded by saying, You better get back now in case your dad is out spying on you. You know what he's like. Having gotten away with her first clandestine rendezvous, Maul would meet up with Bernie under other conditions, like when she got permission from her mother to attend a martial arts class that was taught by Bernie's friend Brian. It was jarring for Bernie. Maul was hoping he would apply for custody, which would expire upon the first day of legal adulthood. But of course, given the paper trail concerning his private relations with Maul, he would not likely have been awarded custody. Maul began her new life with Bernie. They had to negotiate the terms of their subterfuge. She was to wear her hair up, which apparently made her look older. When he brought her to his parents' home, his mother figured out that Maul wasn't 19 years old. When she brought Bernie into another room to speak with him about the matter, his father said to Maul under his breath, Like older men, do you? Then how about sorting out an old man like me? I'll pay you. She was nauseated at the possibility. He was grinning like a toddler eating its own shit. He put his hand down his pants and played with himself. He wasn't done with his pitch. You can come round here any time you want. She doesn't understand me, you see. But I'll look after you. Don't you worry about that. Bernie arrived just in time to extricate her from that display. He was arguing with his mother, who felt he should leave Maul and return to his ex-wife. As Bernie and Maul departed, his father ran his fingers up and down her back, coming to a stop on her buttocks. Maul felt tainted by his father. That feeling left an imprint, and it resisted evanescence. It was uncomfortable back in the car. Bernie said, Why didn't you tell them you were 19, like I said? I did, but she kept asking me questions. She? That she you're referring to as my mother. I fucking told you what to say if they asked you. It wasn't difficult, was it? Maul was frightened by the hard-boiled expression on his face. She had never seen him cast such a shadow before. She said, Your mom wouldn't believe me. I really tried to tell her. Well, you didn't try hard enough then, did you? because she's at home crying now. They want nothing to do with me, and it's all your fucking fault, because you don't do as you're told. Maul felt ashamed. She hung her head. She was at a loss for words. As if she didn't feel bad enough, Bernie had more. Is it because your own parents don't want you anymore? Is that it? Are you that bitter and twisted that you try to destroy my relationship with my own parents? Is this your way of punishing me, little girl? Maul shook her head. She cried. Bernie wasn't satisfied by her tears. Her heart wasn't sufficiently broken. He struck again. I made a mistake bringing you here. You've only been here two days, and already you've turned my life upside down on its arse. I'm taking you back to your parents. Maul begged Bernie not to take her back to her family's home. She never felt loved there and was tired of being abused. She was abused in her life with Bernie, but she was loved. It seemed to her at the time that her life with Bernie was the lesser of two evils. The thought of returning to her parents' home made her cry into a hysteria. Bernie relented and let her stay with him. 
Bernie was a master manipulator. And it was moments like those when it would have been abundantly transparent to anyone who wasn't brainwashed by him. To reinforce the control he held over her, he said, Just don't play your fucking games with me, you little bitch. Because you'll see a whole different side of me, and you won't like it. He punctuated this last point by grabbing her head and bashing it against the passenger's side window. She felt something warm on the side of her head. It spread down her face into her mouth. Within seconds, her taste buds detected the copper-like flavor of blood. Bernie sat quietly as Maul bled. He still wasn't finished. And what did my dad have to say about it all when I was in the kitchen? He searched her face intently, eager to know. Maul was terrified to tell him what his father did. She knew he would become enraged. She began to cry once more. Bernie was hardly a source of consolation. You fucking tell me what he said. Did he try it on with you? Bernie's hostility was escalating. He shouted, Well, fucking answer me. Maul nodded. Bernie said, I knew it. I just knew it. Every bloody time. Bernie went into the house and called his parents, with Maul slowly trailing behind. Bernie began by talking to his mother, saying, Yes, it's me. I don't care if you don't want to talk to me. I suggest you put Dad on the phone now. I couldn't care less if he doesn't want to talk to me. Tell him if he doesn't come to the phone now, then I'll just have you repeat everything back to him. After a pause, his father got on the line. Bernie said, You disgusting old bastard. You couldn't help yourself, could you? You've been doing this to me for years. You'll be lucky if I don't tell Mom what you're really like. It'd kill her, you know that? I'm not going to, but it's for her, not you. You're dead to me. Do you understand? He slammed the handset on the cradle. He turned to Maul. You. You just stay out of my way tonight, or you'll regret it. He stormed off to the bedroom and slammed the door so hard it reverberated throughout the rest of the house. Maul slept on a plastic garden chair that night. Bernie was hired by a factory. He hated it. He wasn't exactly thrilled to be doing such work to support Maul. He didn't value her that highly. He said to her one day, You need to get a job or get yourself into school. The choice is yours. I'm not going to support you financially for sitting around on your arse. He picked up a copy of the Yellow Pages and threw it at her. He said, You'd better be enrolled by the time I get home, else there's going to be trouble. He slammed the door as he left the house on his way to his shift, and the entire house reverberated. Maul went to a local high school and enrolled. The principal was reluctant to take her on since she had moved out of her parents' home. Maul persuaded him to let her study there anyway. She couldn't afford to buy a uniform and couldn't buy the closest facsimile since Bernie wouldn't pay for new clothes. He felt she didn't need them. Bernie was a vegetarian of the fascist variety. One day he saw some food in the kitchen and said, What the fuck is this? You know I can't stand sight of the stuff. Maul was still an omnivore. That night she made him a vegetarian casserole and a meat course for herself. He said, Did you carry it all back in the same bag? You did, didn't you? She denied this, saying she did indeed carry them in separate bags. Also, her item was a box of burgers. This wasn't good enough for Bernie. He said, If I find out you're lying, I'll give you one more chance. Were they in the same bag together or not? She said no. He went through a cupboard and pulled out a shopping bag. There was only one. He said, You lying whore! Why did you fucking lie about it? I didn't. The other bag is in the bin outside. He made her go outside and retrieve the other bag from the bin. As she did so, you'd better get back in here now. You're a fucking liar. I'm not eating this shit. Are you trying to poison me? It hasn't got any meat in it. I don't fucking care. 
He picked up the plate of steaming hot casserole she served to him and threw it at her head. Her scalp was burned. Maul went about the delicate business of cleaning the casserole off her in the bathroom. Bernie appeared in the doorway. He said, Get your coat. We're going out for dinner. Don't worry about the casserole. They went out to an Indian restaurant that night. Bernie was unexpectedly kind to her. He told her that she could order whatever she wanted, but she was still careful not to offend him by ordering meat. Suddenly he said, I've just got to nip out to the car, Mall. I've left my bloody wallet in there. That won't be a minute, pedal, okay? With that, he left the restaurant. Later, the waiter brought the bill to the table. Maul had to keep explaining whenever the waiter returned that Bernie went off to get his wallet. After an hour, there was still no sign that Bernie was going to return. The waiter conferred with someone who may have been the manager. The waiter came over and said, What's happening? It's been nearly an hour. Is he coming back to pay for this meal or not? She said, I don't know. Can I just nip around the corner and see if he's still there? The waiter said, You can't leave. You have to pay for your meal. Maul began to cry. She said, I don't have any money to pay for it. I'm sure he'll be back if you don't mind waiting a little bit longer. Well, where is he parked? Just around the corner, in the quick save car park. After taking a walk, the waiter came back and said, There isn't a single car in the car park. Is there anybody you can call to pick you up? How old are you? She decided she would reveal her age for once. She hoped that her young age might elicit some sympathy. She said, I'm only 16. I don't have anybody I can ring. He doesn't have a phone. Bernie did have a phone. She just didn't want to invoke his wrath by having them call him. The owner said, And you don't have any money at all? She shook her head. The owner said, I'm going to let you get home because I can't expect you to pay for this yourself. It was clearly some kind of cruel trick. If you can give me your address and somebody could pop the money in before the end of the week, I'd appreciate it. A favor for a favor based on trust, eh? Maul wrote Bernie's name and address on a scrap of paper, gave it to the owner, and went home. When Maul returned home, Bernie's car was in the driveway, and the lights were on. Though she was angry at him, she feared him too much to express it openly. When she approached him, he said, Maybe you'll learn your lesson next time, you silly cow. We don't have money to waste, so next time you go shopping, think about what you're doing. All that because she put meat and vegetables in the same bag. He followed up by saying, In fact, Maul, you're too stupid to grasp what I'm trying to say. I think it would be better if you became a vegetarian like me. But I like meat. He laughed. It isn't up for debate, you crazy bitch. While you're under my roof, what I say goes. One day, Bernie came in the house flanked by two companions. He said, this is Tony and Addie from work. They're going to be staying for dinner. What have we got in? She said, there isn't any food in, really. Well, not enough for everyone anyway. We'll need to go to Asda, as does a chain of supermarkets in England. Bernie said, why didn't you go earlier then? What the fuck have you been doing all day? Maul was in school all day. She would have told him that, but his friends were supposed to believe the lie that she was 19 years old. Tony said, We don't have to stay for dinner if it's a problem. Bernie said, It isn't a problem at all, mate. The only problem around here is this lazy, stupid bitch. She can't do anything right. Bernie pointed at Maul and said, Get your shoes on and take a walk up to Asda while you still have your legs. As Maul got dressed for the grocery run, she heard Bernie say, The point is, Tony, is that she lives there and contributes fuck all. I support the lazy bitch, and she can't even be arsed to make sure there's enough food for dinner when I get in from work. 
Maul said to Bernie as she departed, I won't be long. Bernie said, You'd better not be. We were supposed to be upgrading the computers after dinner. Now we've got to wait for you to get back. Why don't you do that while I'm out? He mimicked her voice. Why don't you do that while I'm out? Because that wasn't the fucking plan. That's why. Just get out of my sight. Tony looked at her shoes. They were old and in disrepair. Maul was forced to wear them since Bernie refused to buy a new pair. They were uncomfortable and held together with super glue. Tony said, What size shoe are you? It's just that you look around the same size as my girlfriend, and she probably buys a new pair every week. She's got loads she needs to get rid of. She's a size 5. I'm a size 6, but thanks anyway. She felt shame as she left the house. Bernie shouted after her, Don't forget the wine this time, will you? This despite the fact that the retailers wouldn't sell alcohol to someone so young. When Maul returned home later, the men were tinkering with Bernie's computer. As she did the prep work for the evening meal, she overheard Ada tell a joke whose content included reference to pedophilia and the sexual abuse of children. It made her want to retch. At one point, Bernie returned to the kitchen. Surprisingly polite, he said, Is it ready yet, Petal? While the men had their dinner, Maul took a bath. She locked the bathroom door before doing so. When she took baths, she would crank up the radio so that Bernie wouldn't hear her cry. This was the only circumstance under which she could do it without angering him. To make a complete set with her inner anguish, were the cuts and bruises Bernie inflicted on her body. Explaining these injuries to outsiders, he would say things like, She trains too hard. I keep telling her to calm down a bit, in case people think I'm a wife beater. He followed these remarks with raucous laughter. She hated it when he referred to her as his wife. It made her skin crawl. He interrupted her bath by banging on the door and shouting, Where's the wine? She said, I couldn't get any. They wouldn't serve me. He was outraged. He tried opening the door, but it didn't budge. He said, why the fuck have you locked the door? I suggest you open it now before I break the damn thing down. In a panic, she got out of the tub and put her bathrobe on. She looked at the small window and wished she were capable of escaping from it. When she opened the door, he grabbed her hair and yanked her to the kitchen and onwards to the living room. When he pushed her into the room, her gown fell open, and her naked body was exposed to his friends. She was scarlet from the embarrassment. Bernie said, I suggest you apologize to Addie and Tony. They expected a glass of wine with their dinner, and once again, you fucked everything up. She said, I'm sorry. Tony said, Don't worry about it. It's only bloody wine, Bernie for crying out loud. Addie was less reassuring. In fact, he looked disgusted, putting his feeling of entitlement on full display. Bernie pushed Maul back toward the kitchen. She returned to the bathroom to cry. She heard Tony shouting at Bernie in the living room, Jesus, Bernie, why did you do that? Bernie's response, because she's from a fucked up family. That's why. She needs some discipline and learn some respect. One day, Maul's friend Stacy confessed that she was bisexual and was attracted to Maul. Maul was straight and unable to deal with this news. She couldn't continue on with the relationship. It wasn't just because Maul was heterosexual. Throughout Maul's life, everything appeared to revolve around sex, and it wasn't of the healthy age-appropriate, consensual variety. Her father's creepiness and disrespect of her boundaries. Bernie's pedophilia. Bernie's pervert father. She only associated sex with abuse and other malicious influences. It was always something that was employed for the purpose of injury and degradation. When Maul returned to the trailer she shared with Bernie, he said, Where the hell have you been? I've been with Stacy." Is that the one from school? What does she look like? She's blonde. We've fallen out. 
I'm not surprised. You never seem able to keep friends, Maul. Maybe it's because you're a complete bitch to everybody? She removed her coat and ignored him. He wasn't done picking at her. So, why did you fall out? She came on to me and I didn't like it. She's a lesbian then? No, she's bisexual. And that's a problem for you? It isn't a problem, just a bit of a shock, that's all. I told you you're a bitch. You'd better make up with her. I think it would be cool to have a lesbian around. She's bisexual. I'm going to let the dust settle, and then I'll try talking to her. She was upset when I left. I'm not surprised. Come on, get your coat back on. Why? Where are we going? We're going to Stacy's house, so you can apologize to her. Then you'll invite her around for dinner tomorrow. No, Bernie, I'm not doing it. Maul was horrified by the thought of Stacy being introduced to Bernie. The very possibility would have destroyed her life. She said, I don't know where she lives. Don't you lie to me, you silly cow. You were around at her house not long ago because you went to her 17th birthday party. Have I refreshed your memory yet? Bernie brought Maul into his car. He was going to take her to retrieve Stacy. Maul didn't let on that she knew where Stacy lived. Bernie turned into a gas station. He said, I'm going to fill up now. If you don't remember where she lives, I'll send you door to door. We'll stay out all bloody night if we have to. The worst coincidence ever. When Bernie went into the store to pay for the gas, Stacy and her mother came out of the gas station store. Maul played with the sun visor to block their view of her and they walked by unaware that Maul was around. Suddenly there was a tap on the window. It was Stacy. I thought it was you, Maul. I'm really sorry about earlier. I don't want to lose you as a friend. Maul said, Don't worry about it. I'll speak to you tomorrow about it, okay? Okay, but you're not going to tell anybody about it at school, are you? No, don't worry. Everything's fine. Maul was hoping Stacy would leave. But she had more to say. I was wondering if you wanted to do something this week. Receipt in hand, Bernie was walking toward the door. Stacy said, We could go to the cinema or something like that if you want. Bernie was walking in between cars. He was walking closer. Stacy said, So, what do you think, Maul? Can we still be friends? Bernice said to Stacy, Hello, are, are you one of Maul's friends from school? Yes, I'm Stacy. You are? I'm Bernie. He extended his hand, and they shook. Stacy shot Maul an odd look, which Bernie missed. He said, Would you like to come over for dinner tomorrow evening? Maul has never introduced me to any of her friends. He glared at her. Maul faked a smile. Stacy said, Yes, that would be nice. I was just saying to Maul that we should do something this week. Bernie said, I think that's a great idea. Will about half past six be okay for you? Stacy nodded. Bernie said, It will be nice to get to meet you properly. Do you know where we live, Stacy? Yes, I've been to your place once already, though Maul never actually invited me over. I just bumped into her one day. Bernie said, Okay then, pedal. He turned to Stacy. We'll see you tomorrow. Stacy said, See you then. Bye, Maul. Maul wanted to pack her bags and run away. She dreaded the events that were to follow the next evening. As she and Bernie were pulling out of the gas station, he said, Thought you didn't know where she lived. Fucking liar. The next morning, Bernie was stoked for their dinner with Stacy. He offered to drop her off at Asda. In the meantime, he would pay a visit to his friend James, who turned Maul's stomach. Maul hated James almost as much as she despised Bernie. James was a scumbag. Once when Maul accompanied Bernie on one of his visits to James's house, James minimized a window on his computer, and Maul saw that the desktop wallpaper was comprised of an image of children clad in provocative clothing. James had poor hygiene, reeking of B.O. His hands were visibly filthy and stained by nicotine. 
As Maul prepared for Stacy's visit, she contemplated returning to her family's home. All she would have to do is pick up the phone. The problem was, she also knew they would tell her they told her so, and worse. They would make her life miserable in a different way. At about 6 p.m., there was a knock on the door. Bernie jumped up to answer it. It was James. Maul was unaware that he had been invited. Bernie said, James is staying for dinner tonight, and he's sleeping over too. James brought as his cargo a sleeping bag, a bottle of whiskey, and a large bottle of vodka. He handed a white carrier bag to Bernie. Bernie took it to the bedroom. There was another knock at the door. Bernie raced to answer it. Maul heard him say, Come on in, Pedal. Pedal was his nomenclature for any woman with whom he hoped to gratify himself. It made Maul shudder when he addressed Stacy as such. Maul suddenly got a feeling that something very terrible was about to go down. Everybody but Maul drank during the meal. Bernie, James, and Stacy swiftly established a bond. Maul was the outcast. She was dying to know what was inside the plastic bag. She knew somehow that Bernie and James had something nefarious up their sleeves as the evening's entertainment. Part of the entertainment involved Bernie demonstrating his martial arts moves on James, who was helpless against them. Bernie was showing off, and Stacy was impressed, saying, Oh, Bernie, you're amazing. Maul went to the bathroom and turned the taps on to create the impression she was using the facilities. The truth was, she used this as a ruse to investigate the contents of the plastic bag in the bedroom. She opened the bag and found two adult schoolgirl costumes with crotchless underwear as accessories. There was also a camcorder to record whatever was to transpire for posterity. Bernie and James were planning on getting both girls drunk and exploiting them for the purpose of making child pornography. Maul knew this now, and she also knew she had to get Stacy the hell out of there. After spending a few minutes in the bathroom collecting her thoughts, she decided to spend a portion of the evening playing along with the proceedings. Later, Bernie, James, and Stacy were drunk. After some dancing and sexual innuendo, Bernie said to Stacy, after she indicated her intention to leave, You can stay here tonight if you want, Pedal. Just give your mom a call in a bit and tell her where you are. It'll be like a massive sleepover. Maul lured Stacy outside with a promise of smoking marijuana. She had to have a serious talk with her. She said, Look, Stacy, you don't need to say anything, Maul. I won't tell anybody at school that you live in a caravan with a man old enough to be your granddad or something. Maul decided there was necessity in keeping Stacy away from Bernie's house. Since she had taken a liking to the man, Maul needed to do something that would ensure Stacy would never want to return to see Maul, Bernie, or anybody else. Maul decided to use Stacy's secret against her. The truth, Stacy, is that I just don't like your sort. My sort? I'm confused. What do you mean? You know, your sort. Dykes. You've come into my home and eaten my food. I didn't even want you here. It was him that invited you, not me. Personally, I think you're disgusting. Stacy began to tear up. Inwardly, Maul was racked by guilt. She couldn't let it show. The things she had said were cruel, but they wouldn't cut as deep as what Bernie and James had in store for her. She grabbed Stacy by the neck and moved her face close to hers. She said, I don't want to catch anything from you, so why don't you just get the fuck out of my house? You know, Bernie doesn't like gays either, and when I tell him, you won't be leaving here in one piece. So I suggest you fuck off now. Maul pushed her towards the back door, Stacy stumbled down the stairs. Maul said, Tick-tock, Stacy. I'm going to tell them, so you better get running. Stacy was still crying, not realizing that her former friend had spared her from something infinitely more painful. 
As retaliation, Stacy said, You know what, Maul? I used to think you were okay, but it turns out you're just trailer trash. This comment hurt. Stacy had been her only friend in Peterborough. She had stuck with Maul during a time when she needed a friend, and now she ejected her from her life in a very callous and mean-spirited way. It broke Maul's heart knowing that she was so homophobic and so ruthless in cutting her ties to Stacy. Her only consolation came from knowing what she has saved Stacy from had she spent the night. There was a knock on the porch's door. It was Bernie, followed by James. Bernie said, Are you pairs still smoking in there, or are you doing something else? Bernie and James laughed like cretins. Bernie said, We'd hate to disturb you. Bernie's imaginings no doubt conjured up the images gleaned from some tawdry VHS world whose borders could only be infiltrated in the back room of a video store. When Maul went back inside, he said, Where's Stacy? Is she messing about outside? He walked to the back door and looked out over a park to see where Stacy was. Her home was only a ten-minute walk away, so she was long gone. Maul said, She's gone home because she wasn't feeling too good after all that booze. She asked me to apologize on her behalf. She didn't want you both seeing her in a state. Bernie looked at James. They weren't fooled. They knew Maul was capable of being conniving in her own right. James just said, Oh. Bernie said, You'd better get in here then. He pushed her into the bedroom. He said, James bought you something today. Maul never returned to school after that day. One day the phone rang at Bernie and Maul's trailer. Maul answered it. The voice on the other end said, Hello, I'm ringing about your advert in the Telegraph. I was wondering if it would be okay to come along tonight and watch to see if it interests me. Maul said, You can, but the instructor prefers if you take part. Everybody is pretty much a beginner there because it's a new class. We won't make you do anything you don't want to, I promise. Bernie hated it when people went to the martial arts classes to just stay and watch. He said it distracted him and intimidated the students. Meanwhile, auditing of martial arts classes by curious outsiders is permitted in most martial arts studios. Celine agreed to this condition. She said, Okay, then, what should I wear? Ma listed the articles of clothing she would be expected to wear. The girl introduced herself, laughing as she did so. My name's Celine, by the way and I'll be your entertainment for this evening. I'm Maul. I look forward to meeting you later, Celine. Maul had a good feeling about Celine already, like she was somebody she would like to have as a friend. She also knew she didn't want Celine to become tangled up in Bernie's tentacles. At the martial arts studio, Celine and Maul were introduced face to face. Celine assumed Bernie it was Maul's father, which made Maul cringe. When Bernie proposed a pub night after the class, Celine elected to go. Bernie decided to finally outfit Maul with her own kickboxing club. It would bring a second income into the household. Its appeal for him was also related to his practice of arriving at the end of the class, identifying as Maul's instructor, and flirting with the mothers of the children who were enrolled. By downgrading her publicly as merely one of his students, her students lost respect for her, and became unruly and rude. She asked him to stop degrading her in front of the students. He told her he would do whatever he wanted, though he did eventually put an end to it. Bernie began to abuse Maul by demonstrating martial arts moves on her. He would strike her with as much force as he could muster. By insisting it was in the spirit of improving their skill through training and practice, he was able to abuse her with abandon. He began to groom a student named Michelle in the same way he did Maul, with special attention and gifts. During training sessions, he would play a Beatles cassette, which included the song Michelle. Everybody figured out what was going on. When they went to a pub afterwards, Maul didn't talk to anyone if Celine didn't happen to be around. 
it enabled Bernie to devote his attentions to Michelle. Michelle became of such paramount importance to Bernie that whenever she rode in the car with them, Maul would have to sit in the back seat. On one such occasion, Michelle put her hand on Bernie's thigh. Maul was so brainwashed by Bernie that as Michelle inserted herself into his life, Maul became jealous. Michelle's constant flirting with Bernie aggravated her. Maul sent off for her birth certificate. She assumed she was born in the same place as all her siblings, but she turned out to be wrong. She was not issued the birth certificate, and the check Bernie wrote to cover the cost was deposited. The department's policy when it came to refunds was that the money would not be given back in the event that the outcome was not desirable. The fee covered manpower. Bernie was livid. He said to Maul, I want you to ring them and get my money back. I will not have you ruining my... I will not have you ruining our holiday plans. She told him that it indicated in the small print that the fee covered the search and was therefore unrefundable. She was enraged by how protective Bernie was of his vacation plans. She said, Our holiday plans? More like yours and Michelle's holiday plans. I know what's going on. Don't think I'm stupid, Bernie. He shouted, You stupid bitch! He struck her on her face. It felt like her cheek was on fire. She felt like crying. Bernie wasn't through. I've had enough of your shit. You're just a jealous little cunt. He threw her against a window. He took another shot at her face. Maul had ammunition of her own. And you're just a fucking pervert. Bernie stabbed Maul with a screwdriver. She lost so much blood, she felt lightheaded and fell against the kitchen table. She woke later to the sight of Bernie dressing her wound. She was topless. Bernie defended his position. Look, Maul, I'm sorry for what happened, but you really made me angry. You know I'm not interested in Michelle. She's a fucking tramp and her sister is a junkie. You can't go making accusations like that. When you called me a pervert, I just flipped. You know I'm not a pervert. I can't understand why you'd say such a thing. Maul felt like she was in a vulnerable position. Being at Bernie's mercy was a potentially volatile and dangerous proposition. So she just nodded at whatever he said to her. She apologized for hurting his feelings. Maul had to take a couple of days off from teaching. Bernie taught her class. He made sure to tell the little girls that they were like little angels, commenting on how supple and flexible they were for their ages. This was disgusting to Maul. She knew what it was all about. Maul refused to get her passport together, negating Bernie's ability to take her and Michelle on vacation. She was pleased to see this. One night at a pub, Maul's brother Alex came in. He was performing there as a member of a boy band. Maul didn't want him to see her with Bernie, but it was too late. Alex came over to her table. He gave Bernie the stink eye. Their family knew full well that Bernie was a scumbag. Alex sat next to Maul. He said, how are you, sis? He gave her a hug, which had never happened before. He said, everybody is missing you at home. She said, are they? This was totally unexpected, and she got a lump in her throat. She was dying to tell him about the verbal, physical, and sexual abuse of which she had been a recipient for almost as long as she knew Bernie. She wanted to tell him Bernie stabbed her with a screwdriver. She wanted to tell him she was desperate to return to the family, but was afraid she would not be welcomed. As Alex and his cohorts performed, Maul bragged to students of the martial arts club that he was her brother. Alex would wink at her during one of his vocal solos. At one point, Maul looked across the room through the dry ice fog and spotted Bernie sitting alone. He was glaring at her. She wasn't bothered by it. She now knew there was a way out of her life with him. Alex wasn't able to say a proper goodbye because a cougar dressed like a younger woman was trying to tear the shirt off his back. On the drive home, Bernie said, So what did Alex have to say for himself then? I noticed he completely ignored me. 
How rude, especially after all the quality training I gave him. He's turned into a real big head, Maul. Bernie stuck his nose in the air for emphasis, as if Maul was too green to comprehend such an expression at her age. Maul said, they all missed me. Bernie scoffed. I bet he did. They're poisoning him against us, Maul. Can't you see it? You're lucky you got out when you did. It'll just be another game. I'm sorry to tell you this, but they don't give a shit about you. You could get hit by a bus tomorrow, and I'd be the only person at your funeral. I'm the only one who cares about you. I'm the one who put a roof over your head when you had nowhere to go. Classic abuser isolationism. Maul wanted to tell him to shut up. She found herself wanting to defend her family, despite the way they treated her. Her life had been bookended by different gradations of abuse. But ultimately, what she experienced at her family's home was benign in comparison. She said nothing more to Bernie about the matter at the time, but inwardly she was happy. She now knew she had better options. Relationships waxed and waned in Maul's life. One night when she went to a club with Michelle, they got into a brawl. Maul was thrown out of the club, and it cost Michelle two teeth. Maul became closer with Celine. They would laugh and have fun together. The excursions they took together represented the only happiness Maul experienced at this time in her life. One night during a camping trip, Bernie gave a 14-year-old martial arts student marijuana. The night ended for Maul when Bernie called her into his tent, where he raped her. Celine accompanied them all. At one point, Celine confided in Maul as they walked back to their tents. Maul was not looking forward to it. She remembered how things ended with Stacy after her confession. Celine said, There's something I want to tell you, Maul. When I was at school, I was molested by my P.E. teacher. I couldn't say anything to anybody because I was so scared at the time. Looking back as an adult, I wish I'd just told somebody and reported it. Stop him doing it to somebody else. Do you know what I mean? Maul said, At least you got away in the end. One night, Maul's sister Beryl visited her on her birthday. She said, Happy birthday, Maul. I can't believe you're legally old enough to drink now. Maul was taken aback by Beryl's magnanimity and solicitousness. It wasn't something that came easily to her. Beryl said, Everyone has bought you a present for your birthday. She handed Maul a bag of presents. Maul was moved, but she also suspected it was a ploy to get her to return home. Beryl said, Mom and Dad told me to ask if you wanted to go and visit them sometime. They said they understand you live over in Peterborough now, but they'd like to see you anyway. Maul wanted to take her up on the invitation, but she wouldn't commit right away. She knew Bernie wouldn't let her. He hated her family. He wouldn't even acknowledge Beryl's presence. Maul walked her to her car. Beryl said, Good luck for next week, Maul. Don't get cold feet, will you? What's happening next week? Are you getting bloody married to that pedo? You're not, are you? No, I've got a competition next week, that's all. Okay, well, look after yourself then. I'll tell Mom and Dad that you'll think about it, okay? I can't promise anything. Why don't you just stop putting them through all this heartbreak and go see them? See you later, Beryl. With that, Maul walked back to the pub. The truth was, Maul was tempted to go with Beryl. That's how easy it would have been to disappear. Her family's house was a 15-minute walk away. The problem was, she knew she wouldn't be safe. She was preyed upon in her childhood home as well. Her father was an abusive perv in his own right, after all. She felt like she had very little control over her life. Also unfortunately true, Maul and Bernie were due to marry. He booked the registry office, so a date was set. They issue public notices, so they had to wait a week after her 18th birthday. He had even booked a venue for the reception. She didn't want it, and she was given no say. He was just bowling past her forcing her into things as always. 
The only aspect of it she looked forward to was having Celine as her bridesmaid. As for her birthday, Bernie opened the presents given to her by Beryl. They were a bunch of keepsakes from her childhood that her family had kept. They included a pair of her old shoes. Meanwhile, she was wearing a pair of shoes she owned for two years, and they didn't keep her feet dry. They were so damaged from wear and tear. That was life with Bernie. This was getting married to Bernie. The registrar said, Who gives this lady away? Bernie's friend Jeff said, I do. Jeff made Maul want to puke. He was a creep. Bernie chose him. Everything happened according to Bernie's design. The registrar kept looking at Maul during the service, which she hated. Meanwhile, Maul thought to herself, I'm bloody stuck with him now, aren't I? I'm never going to get away from him now. What would my parents say if they knew I was getting married today? Maul, are you still with us, dear? It was the registrar. Maul nodded. Everybody laughed at her. The registrar continued. Do you take this man? Maul thought, do I? Do I take this dirty old man to be my awful wedded husband? Do I have a fucking choice anymore? She looked over at Celine. Celine gave her a reassuring smile, but there was something about the look in her eyes that suggested she knew what time it was. Maul said, I do. The way she saw it, they would be married on paper and she could get a divorce whenever she wanted to. The ring Bernie gave her was a cheap piece of shit with a cubic zirconia embedded within. This was fine with Maul. She didn't want a real wedding band because to her it wasn't a real wedding. Maul didn't pose for the wedding photos with a beatific smile. She mugged for the camera, making silly faces. After all, the occasion didn't deserve solemnity. At the reception, she chugged beer and whiskey until she blacked out. Nothing improved for Maul after the wedding. Being married to Bernie meant that she would have to wash clothes by hand every day, as before. He beat her both at home and in public, especially in front of strangers he was unlikely to see again. He would accompany her to Asda, as he didn't trust her to go anywhere unescorted. He would verbally abuse her as they shopped, sometimes grabbing items from the shelves and throwing them at her. It was humiliating for her to see the other shoppers looking at her with pity. She didn't want pity. She just wanted them to mind their business. The negative attention was painful in its own right. Celine left for a trip to Australia, and this was very hard for Maul, as Celine was the only person she could confide in. It was sure to be a very painful and lonely time. Before Christmas, Bernie arranged for a gathering of the two martial arts clubs. They congregated at an Indian restaurant, and this time he paid. That night, they went to their associate Rose's house. She brought down a couple of bottles of wine, and everybody had at it. Rose retired for the evening early, as did Bernie. Maul told him she would be up shortly thereafter. Maul had so much fun socializing, she lost track of time. She heard a creak on the landing behind her. She assumed it was Rose. Whoever it was proceeded to run down the stairs. A voice behind her said, You'd better get yourself up these fucking stairs right now. It was Bernie. He wasn't done. If you don't come now, then I'll drag you up by your hair, you fucking bitch. Maul was humiliated that he was doing this in front of her friends. When she stood to face him, she was shocked to discover that he was stark naked. Everybody else was shocked and looked around the room awkwardly. One of the attendees was only 14 years old. Maul was beset by shame. After bringing her to the stairs, Bernie pushed her against them, grabbed her hair, and yanked her to the second floor. Once they arrived in the bedroom, he pushed her onto the bed. He grabbed her hair again and brought her face up to his. He said, You fucking whore. I told you to come to bed nearly an hour ago. You've been sitting downstairs, flirting with those losers instead. You've made me look like a right cunt in front of my own fucking students. If you ever... He punched her in the stomach. He continued, 
ever do anything like this again, I will fucking kill you. Rose never took another class with Bernie or Maul. After five months of marriage to Bernie, it felt to Maul like her life had come to an end. She began to have suicidal thoughts. Bernie ended her kickboxing club. He left it to her to call the parents and let them know after they purchased expensive training equipment. She bore the brunt of their verbal abuse. Bernie was jealous because her class was more well attended than his. Their post-training class pub nights were dwindling in attendance after the fiasco at Rose's house. One day she told him in the car she didn't feel it would be right for him to teach children. He pulled over, grabbed her hair, and pulled her behind a restaurant where he beat her. During the ride back, Bernie said, as Maul cried, You bring these things on yourself, Maul. Nobody values your opinion because you behave like a fucking child. You've scared everyone away at the club. Things were fine until you came along. You've messed up my life. I have no contact with my parents now because of you. One day when Bernie went to visit his scumbag friend James, he ordered Maul to buy coal. The business they bought it from delivered, but he insisted on tormenting Maul by having her carry a large, heavy bag all the way home. The man who sold her the coal leered at her, like sharks catching the scent of chum. They laughed as they watched her struggle with the large bag. She felt humiliated. She felt like crying. The bag split, spilling some pieces of coal onto the ground. It was a struggle carrying that bag down the street. People honked at her as she walked down the street. Some were laughing at her. Others pitied her. She hated the pity, as always. She dropped the bag again, and the coal spilled out all over the place. It was winter, and it became infused with snow and slush. The problem with coal is that after it gets wet, it is no longer usable. Bernie would be furious. Her reaction to this certainty was not uniform with her recent experiences. She snapped. She yelled, fuck it. She kicked the bag until it was entirely drenched in the slush. She didn't care. She was sobbing, but also in a rage. She stormed away toward the trailer. A young man on a bicycle rode past her, asking her if she was okay. She said, fuck off and mind your own business. When Maul arrived home, she screamed. She kicked their garbage bin around the garden. She threw the patio set at the shed. It bounced off the wall and hit her, but this only stoked the inferno of rage that had driven her to it. She nearly kicked the door in as she found it hard to work the key amid the rage that had her shaking. She ran into their squalid living room and smashed everything in sight. She tore the curtains down. She kicked holes in the walls. She was still shaking, but she was thrilled by the sensation of giving herself over to adrenaline. She felt more alive than she had in a long time. Later, Maul made a phone call. The voice in the other end said, Hello? Dad, it's me, Maul. He was relieved to hear from her, but it mattered not to Maul. She also had no time for questions and pleasantries. She said, I need you to come and pick me up now while he's out of the house. Can you come now? Right now? Yes, of course. What has he done to you? Are you okay? I don't have time for questions. I need you to get off the phone and come now. I don't know what time he'll be back. If he gets here before you do, I don't know what'll happen. It turns out he's quite fucking psychotic. Okay, I'm coming now. I'll be there within the next two hours, okay? Just one more thing, Dad. Yes? When you get outside, beep your horn. If you see Bernie's car parked outside, then you call the police, okay? What's going on? You just do that, okay? He's got all kinds of things in here, and he keeps a machete in the boot of his car. Just don't come in here, okay? She gave him the directions to the trailer park, and they hung up. Maul didn't take anything with her. All her personal belongings were tainted by Bernie's presence. She broke into his filing cabinet with a screwdriver and grabbed a VHS tape bearing a label that read, Naughty Schoolgirl Pays the Price. 
She threw it on the floor multiple times, smashing it to smithereens. She yanked the tape out and snapped it so that it would not be playable. She had a flashback to the production of that video. It was produced the evening of the end of her friendship with Stacy. Bernie videotaped himself raping Maul while James stood in the doorway and played with himself. There were similar videotapes and Maul smashed those too. The filing cabinet also contained panties and old love letters from his ex-girlfriends. She threw the cabinet around the porch. She decided to leave him a letter. The following is transcribed from that letter verbatim. Dear Dirty Old Man, It has taken me five years to realize that you are nothing more than a pedophile. You have tried your best to destroy me, but I'm still young enough to put my life back together. If you try to find me, I will do what everybody else failed to do and call the police. I'll tell the whole world about you and your friends. Maul. P.S. I will never be associated with your disgusting surname. She left the cheap shit ring he gave her for their wedding on the note. There was a knock on the front door. She was terrified. When she went to see who it was, she found that it was not Bernie. It was Frank, the owner of the trailer park. He was another one of the endless line of perverts who were always trying to get Maul out of her clothes. He was always coming up with excuses to try to get Maul alone at home, like checking the electric meter every other day. He battered his wife, evident in the bruises he left behind. He was a skinny little beanpole of a man. He rapped harder on the door. Maul had had it with him, too. She yanked the door open and screamed, What the fuck do you want, you little pissant? He wasn't expecting that. He stumbled backwards. He said, I've had a complaint that you've been throwing garden furniture around and smashing things up. If you can't stick to the rules of the park, I'll have to evict you. Maul screamed, So fucking evict me! Get the fuck out of this piece of shit garden! I'll call the police, you crazy bitch. Do it! I'm sure they'd love to hear how you knock your missus about, Frank. Fill your boots! You've got an hour to pack your things and get the fuck off my park before I call them. With that, he walked away. She dispatched him with, Fuck you, Frank. Her parents arrived to pick her up shortly thereafter. They barely recognized her. They hadn't changed much, but they weren't Bernie, and that was a lot. Maul heard some interesting rumors about Bernie after she left him, such as, He had a breakdown. He took horse tranquilizers. He verbally abused anyone within earshot. He'd gotten engaged to a prostitute. There was no evidence to substantiate these claims, but somehow it all seemed plausible, given his history of dysfunctional behavior. He did do a lot of traveling, venturing as far afield as Norway and Africa. A few years later, Maul's sister Kara told her that Bernie had been delivering birthday and anniversary greeting cards by hand to her parents' house. Her mother and father would always throw them away without opening them or notifying Maul that they had arrived. Bernie tried to contact her multiple times during the subsequent 13 years after their split. One day she put a stop to it. She told him firmly, but diplomatically, that he was a pedophile and she did not wish to be contacted by him. Maul had two children and they represent her first experience with familial love unconditional, as it should be. Because her mother had been emotionally unavailable and emotionally abusive, Maul still struggles to form lasting friendships with females beyond a couple of long-term friendships. Maul limits the access her parents have to her children. They have ignored them anyway, and Maul does not want them to suffer the same sting of rejection that caused her so much pain growing up. Her mother remarried and promised Maul at the wedding that she would reach out to her and become close to Maul and the children. She promised to email her and have them over for dinner. Maul never received that email. Maul took up a career in social work. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters.
Bye for now.